Faith, Hope, and Love by Neville Goddard. Scripture makes the most profound statements in the world. You can believe them or reject them, but you will never know the truth until Scripture is experienced. When it is once experienced, you can no more deny it than you can the humblest evidence of your senses. I make the claim, God is love. Scripture tells us God is faith, saying, Through faith the world was made by the word of God. And we are told to put your faith, or put your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the resurrection of Jesus Christ in you. Now I can tell you that his name is I am, and that God's first revelation to man is that of the Father. I can tell you that all this is true of yourself, that you are God the Father, that you are infinite love, infinite faith, and infinite hope. But you will not know this truth until it becomes your own experience. After you have experienced scripture, there is no power in the world that can persuade you that you were hallucinating. For when you experience this truth, you are on a far greater level of awareness than anything known to man on this level. Whether he be an Einstein, a great financial giant, or a famous doctor, he is aware only of this level, and what I speak of here is on an entirely different sphere. What you experience is separate from this world, and that experience is what I call religion. Religion is a devotion to the reality of an exalted experience the reality of which reason and the senses may deny. But you will know you had the experience. Now let me share with you three letters I received this week. One lady, who is very much a lady, writes, On the night of January 24th, I was sitting quietly, meditating, when suddenly something turned or opened in my head, and I heard a voice say, I am faith, hope, and love. A moment later, a deep, glorious, masculine voice added, I am the Father. Those words touched me with such emotion that I burst into tears and cried and cried. The shortest sentence in scripture is, Jesus wept. At the very end of the drama, one was supposed to be the rock on which the whole would be established, denied the story three times before the cock crowed. Then, remembering all that was foretold, he wept bitterly. Now, to embrace an experience, one must have an experiencing nature. For it is only from an experiencing nature that the furnaces of affliction can refine the essence of faith, hope, and love. Here is a statement from the 48th chapter of Isaiah. Now you will know, now you will hear things that you have never known before. From of, from of old your ears have not been opened. But I tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how can my name be profane? My glory I will not give to another. You may think that because you have perfect pitch and can hear the slightest sound that your ears are open. But they are sealed to the heavenly voices, completely sealed to the heavenly world. But now I tell you, God is love, he is faith, and he is hope. His initial hope was, let us make man in our image. Having the faith that it could be done, it took love to do it. It is love who is put through the furnace of affliction. And although it seems to be hell while experienced, love turns man into a living soul so man can respond. For without response, there is no action. In the silence, this lady heard the words, I am faith, hope, and love followed by a deep masculine voice saying, I am the Father. Now she knows that she incarnates God and that he radiates from her own wonderful human imagination. Having had this experience, there is no priest, no minister or archbishop who could persuade her out of it. This lady is unknown to the world, yet she has experienced that which is unknown to its intellectual and financial giants. I tell you, scripture is true. And the day will come when the voice will reveal her as the Father. That is when God's only begotten Son stands before her and calls her Father. Then she will know and say, I have found David. He has called me my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You might think that a lady could not have, could not have the experience of being the Father, 
but in this dimension of which I speak we are the Elohim. We are not male or female, but God, yet God made up of many. The word Elohim is a compound unity, one made up of many. We are all the one Father of the one and only begotten Son, the quintessence of man's experiences personified as David. The voice who spoke to her declared eternal truth. And when you stand in the presence of the risen Christ and hear the words, God is love, you will know its eternal truth. Then when he incorporates you into his body, you will not be two any more but one. Then, as he incorporates himself into another and still another, we will all be gathered back into the one body, the one spirit, and we will all know we are the Father. There aren't numberless fathers. We all fell from the One Father, and we are all gathered together back into the One Father, who said to the lady, I am the Father. I can't tell you my thrill when I received that letter. Now, to have a great experience, you must have an experiencing nature. For only by an experiencing nature can you devise the essence of faith, hope, and love. And when it happens, the tears fall. Peter was not emotionally moved when the truth was intellectually heard, but when it was experienced and the whole thing came to pass in him, he wept bitterly. One day you will experience scripture and know how true it is. I am speaking from experience when I tell you that I stood in the presence of the risen Christ and spoke the words of Paul, faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Then I was embraced by man who is infinite love, who is God, and what I have experienced, you will experience also. There are those who speak of God as an oversoul, or impersonal force. They have become so abstract in their concept of this creative and redeeming power. But God is not an oversoul or intangible force, but man. And he speaks with a voice as I speak to you now. You hear me in the tongue in which you were born. When God speaks to you, you will hear him in your natural tongue. And when you stand in the presence of infinite love, it is man, and yet you will know he is all love. Now let me share another experience. We are told in the book of Genesis that when a dream is doubled, God has fixed it and it will shortly come to pass. This lady had three dreams of elephants. In her first dream, she said, it was a mating season and I saw many elephants, all in the creative act. This dream was followed by a dream in which she found herself standing by a river, surrounded by mountains. On the river's bank stood three stone elephants, and as she looked at them, they became animated, entered the river, and swam downstream. Watching them, she said to herself, This is the second time I have seen stone elephants. The last time was when they came out of the mountains. Then she added, when I awoke, I realized what I had said was true. There is a language of symbolism that is universal. Regardless of whether you are in Africa, in China, or here, in the depth of the soul, the elephant is a symbol of God's creative power and wisdom, which is defined in Scripture as Jesus Christ. In her dream, she, rem rem she remembered another dream. So this dream is bordering on self-revelation which is God revealing himself in her. God's creative power has made itself known to her, and she will, in the immediate present, have tangible proof of the fact that her own wonderful human imagination is Christ Jesus. All things are possible to God, and by the exercise of this power, she can prove that she is the creative power of the universe symbolized as in the creative act this power appeared a stone which has not been made alive something was seemingly dead in our world but it doesn't matter the power is not there it's not in space and the stars or teacup leaves power is not in anything outside of the human imagination all that you behold though it appears without it is within in your imagination of which this world of mortality is but a shadow to prove this to herself, she saw the elephants as dead, all made of stone. Is there anything more inanimate, more dead than stone? Yet the moment she beheld them, they became animated and entered the stream of life. 
She was in a wonderful mountainous area, and all through scripture revelations took place from the mountaintops. Jesus was on the mountaintop when he transfigured himself, and now here in this mountainous area, her own creative power was revealed. So I repeat, God, the Creator, and your own wonderful human imagination are one and inseparable. Therefore, he will never be so far off as to even be near, for nearness implies separation. Now she knows, as does the other lady, that she incarnates God and God radiates from her as her own wonderful human imagination. What are you imagining now? Is it something disastrous, or is it a wonderful thought that has caught fire within you? No matter what your thoughts may be, they will come to pass, for there is nothing in this world but that which was first imagined. In the January issue of a magazine called The National Observer, there is a picture of a demolished railroad threshold. You see a large section of the train broken, with many cars demolished and one suspended over the edge of an embankment. It is a photograph of an accident which, ha which happened recently in Reuben, Idaho. The same picture had appeared in their December issue, and when a reader in Springfield, Virginia saw it, he thought it strangely familiar. Then he remembered that 19 years ago he had been sketching, and a scene just came out of his imagination, a scene that was a duplicate of the accident that happened this past year. Sending a picture of his sketch to the National Observer, he asked, is it fate that my picture so closely resembles the actual accident? He thought the train wreck was the actual event, but it was the effect. He was the cause. This is a world of shadows. He drew the accident, even to the trees surrounding it. What he called the actual event was only the effect in the shadow world. So I say to this lady, you have touched the depth of your soul, the creative power of God, and no one is going to take it from you, for your power has grown to the point of revelation. You can't turn back now and believe in any outside God. Those who have not had the vision can still turn back. There are those on whom the seed fell. And although they eagerly took it, the cares of the world took them away. Or those that, because the seed fell among thorns, it was cast off. Or those that, traveling the highway of life, they tried and proved the creative power, but decided that it would have happened anyway, or that it was just coincidence. But in your case, my dear, you can't turn back. There is no power on earth that can turn you back to any orthodox belief, for you have seen the symbol of the creative power of God. Starting as the creative act, you turn stone into something alive, and it has entered the stream of life. You know now that you have the power to take something that is dead and barren as stone and in your mind's eye resurrect it, breathe upon it, and make it alive. Now the other letter was from a gentleman. His is on another level. In his dream he sees a house from which a glow radiates from its windows and doors. Someone near asked, when you enter the house, how will we know you are doing it? And he answered, I only do what is necessary, but no matter what I do, you will still say it is a trick. Then a voice spoke from within him, saying, I have power I know not of. This gentleman has the power to create, but he has not entered the state of consciousness to exercise it. He knows that when he enters his house and things happen, it is he who says it would have happened anyway. There are no others. There is only God in this world. Although he answered the question, there was doubt. He always takes it with him as he enters a new state of consciousness, therefore never quite sure that his imaginal act was the cause of the phenomena of life. Here we see various levels of the revelation of God within man. The first one was a fantastic, I am the Father. And in the not distant future, she will know this truth in the most intimate manner. No longer will it be as a voice coming from the depth of her soul, but she will know she is the father when God's only begotten son stands before her and calls her father. In the meantime, God is radiating from her own wonderful human imagination. She knows that I am faith, I am hope, and I am love. She has read it in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. She has heard it from the platform, but she knows it now from Revelation. 
She heard the words coming from within herself, and when David and the Spirit calls her Lord, she will prove to herself that everything I say from the platform is true. So I repeat, we will not know scriptural truth until it is experienced, and then we cannot deny it any more than we can the humblest evidence of our senses. God's first revelation to man is power, Almighty God, El Shaddai. His second revelation is I am. My name is in you. Listen, take heed, hearken to my voice, for my name is in you. And his final revelation is that of Father. In the 40th Psalm, it is said, Thou hast given me an open ear. This is repeated in the 10th chapter of Hebrews in this manner. Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. The open ear of Psalms has now become a body, an immortal body that cannot die. Something turned and opened, and although from, old, from of old the lady had not heard, now she hears. Your garment of flesh and blood has ears, but I speak of an entirely different body. I speak of the body which has been put through the furnaces, which has been prepared for the heavenly kingdom. So judge not from appearances, for although they may be famous and extremely rich, they are still asleep, and when they depart this world they will enter another world of the dead. But she, although unknown here, will enter the world of life, for her body has been prepared for the age that is to come. Your faith is justified not by any argument, but by an experience. Tell me what you believe, and I will hear your confession of faith. Tonight, believe the words the lady heard. Say within yourself, I am the Father, and you will hear your own confession of faith. That is where the true spirit of Scripture is, all within self. And God's creative power is in you. So if tonight you want something, know it is contained within you. You have the power to animate it and make it alive. Then have faith, have confidence, that in its own good time what you have imagined will come to pass. You need not tell anyone or devise a means of its fulfillment. All you need is faith. Through faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so set your hope fully upon this grace of God, which is the hope of man. God gave himself to you as though there were no other, and when his son stands before you and calls you father, you will know that faith has transformed itself into vision, that hope has been completely realized, and that love endureth forever. Now let us go into the silence. <laughs> 